On one side is Louis Pasteur, a Frenchman in his 50s and a chemist. Bravo. He's already famous for his work on germs and the conservation of wine. On the other is Robert Koch, a German 20 years his junior. <coughs> a totally unknown country doctor. <laughs> At this point, they have never met. Yet their confrontation will revolutionize science. At the end of the 19th century, epidemics were decimating populations. Tuberculosis, diphtheria, cholera, and the plague were still as much feared as they had been in the Middle Ages. What caused them? How were they passed on? Scholars were still stuck with the same theories. Heredity, insalubrity, or divine punishment. But some pioneers were putting forward a radical idea. What if the bugs that could be observed under a microscope played a role? Their intuition was right. Medicine was about to change forever. Microbes had been revealed as the agents that pass on epidemics. But who was behind this scientific breakthrough? For the French, it was the work of Louis Pasteur, while the Germans were convinced Robert Koch's research was key. Perhaps both of them, or was one against the other? What if their rivalry was the source of this revolution? Monsieur le Président de la République, je me vois contraint, à l'âge de 50 ans, de faire valoir mes droits à la retraite comme professeur. Ma maladie a été déterminée par l'excès du travail auquel je me suis livré pendant des années. In October 1872, the chemistry professor Louis Pasteur was weary. Four years earlier, a stroke had left him partially paralyzed on his left side. His family life had also been a series of tragedies. Of his five children, three had died of sicknesses. But Pasteur was retiring from teaching so he could work even harder. The chemist wanted to continue the research that had made him famous. His work on wine and beer had led to the discovery that fermentation was the work of microorganisms. And he had an intuition. Similar organisms, invisible to the naked eye, played a much more important role. What if they were responsible for human illnesses? The idea was revolutionary, and he was determined to explore further. Oui? Tu ne m'entendais pas? Nous allons dîner. Oui, j'arrive tout de suite. And yet, Pasteur hesitated. He was not a physician. It was not his field. It would take something else to push him onto this terrain. Something, or perhaps someone. A thousand kilometers from Abois, in the little Prussian town of Wolstein, a young country doctor had questions of his own. Allez-y, tendez votre bras. Ça tire. Euh, alors, si ça tire, c'est bien. Vous pouvez vous habiller, Monsieur Carfer. Dr. Robert Koch tended to his patients. Et vos bêtes, comment vont But it was not his patients that bien, concerned him bien, most. J'en ai perdu trois encore. Toujours le charbon. The doctor was interested in anthrax, a disease that was decimating livestock in the region. As soon as his day was done, Koch was eager to get back to his research. He would spend hours in his makeshift laboratory, staring through the microscope his wife had given him. He wanted to find the cause of this terrible disease. At the time, anthrax was killing hundreds of thousands of domesticated animals in Europe. They would swell up and die in a matter of hours, hemorrhaging black blood. Koch 
Koch had discovered tiny elongated organisms in the blood of infected animals, bacteria. Could they be the source of the illness? To establish this, they first had to be cultivated and then introduced to a healthy animal. But how? After months of trials, he finally found the solution. Il m'a pas fait payer. J'ai voulu, mais rien à faire. Il m'a dit que pour le docteur, ce serait toujours gratuit. Merci. Koch had discovered that microbes could be cultivated using an ox's eye. <laughs> On dirait que je t'apporte de l'or. <laughs> mais c'est très précieux, tu sais. Dieses Kammerwasser ist steril. The liquid contained in the eye is sterile. Koch drew it out of the ox eyes and used it for his cultures. Der Vorteil ist the advantage of this aqueous humor is that it's rich in nutrients. The bacteria are very happy there and multiply fast. Now he had to perform the second stage, injecting this culture into a healthy animal. Papa, papa, il y a un lapin qui est très malade. Il va venir, ne sois pas si impatient, Gertrude. A few days later, the doctor had the demonstration he hoped for. The rabbit inoculated with his culture had died of anthrax. For the first time in history, this modest country doctor had just proved that disease could be passed on by bacteria. But Koch was not ready for the consequences of his discovery. His findings sent a shockwave through the scientific community. Koch then had to face critics, among them a famous French chemist. At the Academy of Medicine in Paris, the newly retired Louis Pasteur was enraged. J'ai la traduction complète depuis hier, et ça n'est pas sérieux. Ces conclusions sont pourtant celles que vous suggériez dans vos travaux, Monsieur Pasteur. Précisément, il n'en dit aucun mot. Trouvez ça normal? C'est vraiment lui, Pasteur. It was in fact Pasteur who was the first to state clearly that disease like fermentation, was due to microbes. And now this totally unknown doctor claimed to have demonstrated that a microbe caused a disease, in this case anthrax. So Pasteur was not best pleased at seeing his theory proved by a humble doctor. The second catastrophic element was that Koch was German. A decade earlier, Pasteur had been an admirer of Germany. But the war had swept all that away. In July 1870, Napoleon III attacked Bismarck's Prussian forces. But an overconfident and ill-prepared imperial army was cut to shreds in three weeks. On September 2nd, Napoleon III capitulated. France lost Alsace and Lorraine. Pasteur, who was close to the emperor, was distraught. All of my work to my dying day will bear the epigraph, hated for Prussia, revenge, revenge. Deep down, Pasteur was sure the German doctor was right. But he thought his demonstration was lacking. It was the work of an amateur. It was time to carry out a much more rigorous experiment. You have the last dilution? La voilà, Monsieur Pasteur. Bien. Et bien, vous refaites exactement la même chose, quelques gouttes dans l'urine. Pasteur decided to reproduce Koch's experiment but using his own method. Yeah, parfait. Unlike the country doctor, he had a modern laboratory and assistants. And the results were unequivocal. 
Koch was right. It was indeed the anthrax bacteria which transmitted the disease. But Pasteur wanted to go further. He wanted to solve the mystery of this illness, whose origins remained a mystery. It was a disease which occurred during summer, and there was a strange phenomenon of cursed fields. These were places where outbreaks were recurrent every year, or at least regularly, in the same spot. These places were said to be cursed. In summer 1878, Pasteur decided to study this phenomenon in the field. With his new assistant, Dr. Emile Roux, he visited Mr. Manouri, an important farmer in the Chartres region, where anthrax was taking a terrible toll. Pasteur had read Koch's work attentively, and the German had already made significant progress on the issue of cursed fields. In Wolstein, he had discovered that anthrax bacteria produce spores, which appear as shiny round dots. These are dehydrated bacteria, which allowed the disease to remain in hibernation. But that did not explain everything. How could these spores remain for several years in the same fields, despite the wind and rain? Analysis of the worms would confirm Pasteur's intuition. The mystery of the cursed fields had finally been resolved. It was the earthworms that carried the germs and which, from the depths, brought this terrible parasite to the surface of the ground. By completing the German doctor's work, the Frenchman's career took a decisive turn. The fight against contagious diseases was underway. In the summer of 1880, to the dismay of local residents, Dr. Koch left the small town of Wolstein for Berlin. Thanks to his work on anthrax, the young doctor had been noticed and was offered a bacteriology laboratory with the title of government advisor. This man, who had always worked alone, would now be surrounded by the best in his field. Monsieur. Koch had a new goal. After anthrax, he wanted to understand the origins of specifically human diseases. But to become a microbe hunter, he would have to improve his techniques. This was when he developed a key innovation for microbiology, culture in a solid medium. Until now, cultures had been grown in liquid environments. When dealing with only one sort of bacteria, such as in sheep's blood infected with anthrax, it was easy to cultivate. But when there were several kinds of bacteria, it was much more difficult to isolate them. The doctor's first breakthrough involved growing bacteria on potatoes. But this method did not work for the microbes he was interested in those which could transmit disease. Monsieur, venez voir, s'il vous plaît. After numerous trials, he finally found the perfect medium. Et donc vous avez utilisé de la gélatine, tout simplement. De la gélatine Et... Nous pourrions ainsi cultiver n'importe quelle bactérie Je le pense, oui. 
his discovery was revolutionary. This new technique meant that identifying microbes took on a whole new dimension. Ah, Monsieur Pasteur. While the German doctor honed his techniques, the Frenchman was preparing a coup of his own. Et vous êtes Tulier, assistant de Monsieur Pasteur. Bien, tout est prêt, Monsieur Rossignol. Nous avons suivi vos dernières instructions à la lettre. Allons-y, alors. Suivez-moi. Allons, allons, écartez-vous. On May 5, 1881, Pasteur set out to perform a public experiment on anthrax vaccination. The principle of vaccination had been understood since the end of the 18th century. An English physician, Edward Jenner, had demonstrated that subjects could be protected from smallpox, a very dangerous sickness, by injecting them with pus containing the bacteria of a related but less serious illness, cowpox. Although Jenner had invented vaccination, he didn't know why it worked. Pasteur thought he had found the answer. Smallpox was certainly caused by a microbe, and the vaccine must be a milder form of the same microbe. He had already achieved some results with anthrax when a vet, Mr. Rossignol, challenged him to make a public demonstration. J'espère que vous savez ce que vous faites, Monsieur Pasteur. Nous sacrifions une cinquantaine de moutons. Uh, non, Monsieur Rossignol. Vous n'en sacrifiez que la moitié. L'autre moitié sera vaccinée et sauvée par la vaccination. Nous verrons bien. Roux, Tuilier, où en êtes-vous Nous sommes prêts, Monsieur Pasteur. On May 5th, Pasteur's team carried out the first ever public vaccination program involving 50 sheep. Twenty-five of them were given a first injection of attenuated anthrax, intended to protect them. For the next month, the public flocked to the farm to observe their behavior. But the public were mainly interested in the second injection, when full-blown anthrax would be introduced to all 50 sheep, those vaccinated and those unprotected. The experiment at Puy-le-Four was an incredible gamble. No one would ever repeat an experiment like that in front of the press and the public. He vaccinated the animals. He could easily have destroyed his reputation because experiments like that can go wrong in many ways. He did it anyway. Vous avez dû vous tromper dans une injection, ou ce n'est pas possible autrement. Monsieur, je vous assure, j'ai respecté absolument... Vous ne vous rendez pas compte Une brebis qui meurt, et c'est toute l'expérience qui va être mise en cause. Je ne parle pas de ma réputation. Calme-toi, Louis. Il n'y en a qu'une seule. C'est peut-être autre chose. Autre chose Mais Même si c'était vrai, personne ne le croira. Est-ce que tu es sûr que la brebis est morte Elle va peut-être s'en sortir Elle était mourante hier soir, alors qu'il est... Monsieur, même ainsi, ça reste un taux de réussite exceptionnel. Mais vous raisonnez comme un scientifique, Roux. Vous croyez que les gens sont prêts à jouer leur vie à la loterie Non. Ou ça marche, ou ça ne marche pas. C'est un nouveau télégramme de Melun. C'est Rossignol. La brebis s'est remise. Ah, alors bah Tu vois bien. On a réussi, monsieur Pasteur. Évidemment qu'on a réussi. Vous êtes toujours à douter, vous. Hein? Two months later, Pasteur was invited to the International Medical Congress in London. In the wake of his success at Puy-le-Fort, Pasteur's appearance was a triumph. Dear Marie, 3,000 members of the Congress gathered. People packed in, a variety of speeches, only one name mentioned, mine, followed by an ovation. I was bursting with pride inside at the thought of being exceptionally distinguished in the midst of this vast gathering of foreigners, especially Germans, who are here in considerable numbers. Among this German contingent, Pasteur certainly didn't notice the humble doctor who had so irritated him with his article. Koch was not part of the elite. He watched Pasteur's appearance as a simple spectator. 
Koch was expecting the celebrated chemist to acknowledge his work on anthrax. But Pasteur made no mention of him. Koch was very upset. After three years of laborious work while still practicing as a doctor, he had made a full study of the disease, and he thought that this at least deserved to be mentioned. Koch was seething and was planning to leave London without meeting Pasteur when the English surgeon Joseph Lister stepped in. Lister had organized the Congress and was a great admirer of Pasteur. He was also very impressed by Koch's recent discoveries with growing cultures in a solid medium. He invited Pasteur to attend a demonstration. Lister arranges to have them both in his laboratory. Koch gives a demonstration of his new techniques, and Pasteur is quite surprised. Pasteur was won over and ended up admitting, this is a great step forward, sir. So Pasteur paid a compliment to Koch, and after that, one might imagine that everything was fine between Pasteur and Koch. Pasteur cannot isolate the anthrax bacillus. Pasteur's experiment is of no value. It even smacks of naivety. Robert, il est vraiment tard, tu sais. Oui, je sais, je sais. His work has led to confusion on many questions that had already been resolved or were about to be. Tu écris depuis ce matin. Emile, laisse-moi tranquille. Viens te coucher. <laughs> As soon as he was back from London, Koch wrote an article attacking Pasteur's work. Stung by his rebuke, he did what Pasteur had never done. He took on a human disease. He chose the deadliest of the day, tuberculosis. In the age of industrialization, the sickness was widespread in insalubrious neighborhoods. In cities, it killed one adult in three, in certain working districts, it wiped out 60% of children. But where did it come from? Most doctors thought it was hereditary. Koch did not agree and went in search of the microbe. It was a tricky task. These were tiny organisms that grew very slowly and which were difficult to spot, even under the microscope. But Koch was sure he was on the right track. He developed a coloring technique to identify the bacteria. Patiently, day after day, over many months, he closed in on the suspects. On March 24, 1882, Koch summoned his most eminent colleagues. Mes chers collègues, si je vous ai réuni aujourd'hui, c'est pour évoquer un sujet sur lequel je travaille depuis plusieurs mois. He only told them he would be discussing tuberculosis. La tuberculose est une maladie bien plus dangereuse que la peste qui provoque des ravages. The participants mainly came out of curiosity, but they soon realized they were witnessing an historic moment. L'éventualité d'une bactérie longue comme un In his usual matter-of-fact manner, Robert Koch told them how he had succeeded in identifying the tuberculosis bacteria. Il peut être affirmé que les bacilles sont donc la cause de la tuberculose. The assistants were stunned. Messieurs, je vous remercie. Tuberculosis had been known since antiquity. Koch had started work on it seven months previously. This was incredibly fast to identify one of the most dangerous bacteria known to mankind. A few days after their initial publication, his findings were reported in the international press. The tuberculosis bacteria would soon be known simply as Cox bacillus. A year after the London Congress, Koch was buoyed with new confidence when he attended the International Hygiene Congress in Geneva. This time, there would not be just one star as in London, but two. 
And this time, the Frenchman and the German were not arriving on the same terms. There had been no exchange between them since Koch's harsh criticism in the wake of the London Congress. Robert Koch arrived proudly, thanks to his discovery of the tuberculosis bacillus, while Pasteur was plotting his revenge, having since read Koch's response to his presentation in London. He had already drafted a speech to demolish Koch's critique. Pasteur stayed in the Hotel des Bergues on the shores of Lake Geneva. For once, he was accompanied by his wife, Marie, who had carefully crafted his speech, along with his young assistant, Louis Tullier. On the morning of the 5th of September, he spotted Koch, who was staying in the same hotel. They bid one another a silent greeting. Pasteur was saving himself for the Congress. Gentlemen, the committee of this Congress. At 2 p.m. in the hall of the university, Pasteur took to the podium and was met with an ovation. Koch was seated in the front row. Pasteur began his speech in Geneva, describing his work on vaccination against foul cholera, anthrax, and so on. His speech was quite short. Then all of a sudden, he veered off and attacked Robert Koch. I have encountered, both in France and abroad, some fierce detractors. Permit me to single out among them he whose personal merits most deserves our attention. I'd like to talk about Dr. Koch of Berlin. And he totally ridiculed the arguments that Koch had put forward in his article, and also those put forward by his colleagues. Suddenly, Koch grew angry. He seemed utterly appalled, and he tried to interrupt Pasteur. To sum up, not one of the criticisms leveled by Koch and his pupils stands up. All they did was underline the mistakes and inexperience of their authors. Koch got up on stage. The audience held its breath. But despite his frustration, Koch declined to debate. I don't believe there is any point responding to attacks here. Since I do not speak French and Mr. Pasteur does not speak German, we cannot engage in a meaningful discussion. I reserve the right to respond to Mr. Pasteur through the medical journals. Pasteur, Pasteur was a great orator, whereas Koch was no such thing. He wasn't a charismatic speaker. He certainly would not have been able to match Pasteur in a battle of oration. My dear Roux, I won't tell you about Geneva. Tullier can do that. Everything went well. Koch was greatly ridiculed, quite besmirched. The two scholars left Geneva without speaking to one another. It was the second time they had met. It would be the last. On the subject of anthrax, everything we heard amounted to results of no interest whatsoever. I brought no new scientific elements, really, sir? Pasteur is happy to trot out generalities, which naturally change nothing for the topic itself. Pasteur is not even a doctor. You hadn't even cut your teeth in science when I was concentrating on isolating and growing microbes in a pure state. A fresh epidemic gave them the first opportunity for a confrontation in the field. In the summer of 1883, cholera threatened Europe. The outbreak began in Egypt. The whole Nile Delta was infected, the disease killing some 500 people a day. France, as the colonial power, had to play a leading role. A mission was set up in Alexandria on the 15th of August. Now aged 60, Pasteur did not join the trip. He put the mission in the hands of his disciple, Emile Roux. 
On the other side of the Rhine, the German government entrusted Koch with a similar task. The German led his delegation in person when they arrived in Alexandria on the 24th of August. Dear Emmy, I arrived here yesterday. It is hot but bearable. I went to bed after midnight, and we were at work at 5 a.m. Nous en avons trouvé un qui est mort ce matin. Et vous êtes sûr que c'est le choléra, Gavki Absolument. The epidemic will not last much longer. Fortunately, we quickly found someone who had died of cholera to begin our analysis. C'est bien. Faites-le transporter en salle d'autopsie, Gavki. Bon travail. D'accord, docteur. So far, we are all in good health. May that continue. Oui, c'est une nouvelle lettre d'Égypte. Ah. Qu'est-ce qui se passe C'est tu lié. Lié. Mon Dieu. Il fut gai toute la journée. Et à 3 heures du matin, il se sent très mal et entre dans la chambre en criant « Roux, je me sens très mal ». Et il tombe sur le plancher. Nous avons cru à une indigestion à 8 heures du matin. On peut le considérer comme mort. This was a total disaster for him. He blamed himself and felt guilty. That said, he had given them a whole host of instructions not to take any risks. Despite that, poor Tuilier, who he held very dear and who was a gifted and brilliant student with much promise, died at the age of 26. Mr. Koch and his team came over as soon as the news spread across town. They found the most touching words for the memory of our dearly departed. This was quite a surprising episode in the relationship between Koch and Pasteur. The death of Tuilier created a sort of truce in their confrontation. These gentlemen brought two wreaths that they themselves nailed to the coffin. They are modest, said Mr. Koch, but they are made of laurel like those given to the glorious. As the epidemic petered out, the source of the cholera remained a mystery. But Koch refused to give up. He had a lead in the shape of a bacillus found in the gut. He wanted to pursue his research in a place with cholera. One month later, he arrived in India with his assistants Gafki and Fischer. As soon as he arrived, Koch made a crucial observation. Whereas Pasteur thought cholera was passed on by air, Koch and his team understood the key role of water. He noticed how each time the locals washed their clothes soiled by cholera in sources of drinking water, the sickness spread. The doctor continued his hunt for the agent responsible. And three weeks later, he sent a triumphant communique to Berlin. I can conclude that the bacillus found in the gut of infected patients is indeed the pathogenic bacillus behind cholera. We have identified what differentiates its bacteria. The bacillus is in the shape of a comma. With tuberculosis and cholera, Koch had identified the two most deadly microbes in the world. In May 1885, he was appointed professor at the Institute of Hygiene in Berlin. His fame now equaled that of Pasteur. The Frenchman even lagged behind the German, since he had made no major discoveries on human illnesses. It was time for him to take on a scourge that struck terror into the heart of man, passed on by the bite of a dog, fox, or wolf, rabies.
the symptoms of rabies are terrifying. Hallucinations, convulsions, a phobia of water, savage behavior. Once infection is confirmed, certain death follows. There is no treatment. Rabies wasn't, however, a priority. It only led to a handful of fatalities a year, nothing in comparison to the thousands who fell victim to tuberculosis. But it had one feature that Pasteur found very interesting. Rabies begins with a bite. Then the wound heals. Nothing happens. Then two, three, four, sometimes six months later, the disease appears. This time lag changed everything. Unlike the vaccine for smallpox or anthrax, which must be administered before infection by the disease, with rabies, one could vaccinate a victim who had already been bitten and head the disease off. The vaccine would also be the remedy, a potentially spectacular breakthrough. But Pasteur faced a problem he had not dealt with before. The microbe was invisible. It was, in fact, a virus, much smaller than bacteria and impossible to see with microscopes of the day. Pasteur therefore had to work by deduction. After weeks of trials with his disciple, Dr. Roux, he succeeded in vaccinating a dog, then a second one, and then more. On en est à combien de chiens Eh bien, depuis le début, on peut dire que 40 ont été vaccinés avec succès. On y est, oh, n'est-ce pas Je suis pas sûr, monsieur. Louis C'est encourageant, mais... Oui, tu es là Louis Il y a une dame qui est là avec son fils. Elle a traversé tout Paris pour te voir. Son fils a été mordu. Je lui ai dit que tu ne pouvais rien faire, mais elle insiste. Tu sais bien que je ne suis pas prêt. Je lui ai dit, mais, mais va au moins lui parler. Elle est désespérée. Elle est venue d'Alsace pour te voir. Alsace. This was animal experimentation. But the passage from experiments on animals to experiments on human subjects, scientifically speaking, should have been a long way off. There wasn't sufficient testing to switch to any trials of treatment on a person. Alors, qu'est-ce qui t'est arrivé, mon bonhomme? Je me suis fait attaquer par un chien. Le chien était enragé. Il s'est jeté sur lui, docteur. Je ne suis pas docteur, madame. Ou examinez-le, s'il vous plaît. Monsieur, on dit que vous soignez la rage. Oh, soignez? Non, madame. Non, nous essayons de vacciner pour empêcher la maladie de se déclarer. Mais de toute façon, le vaccin n'est pas prêt. Mais on dit pourtant que vous vaccinez des chiens. Oui, madame, comme vous dites, ce ne sont que des chiens. Monsieur Pasteur, je sais ce que c'est que la rage. Je vous en prie, vaccinez-le. Ce n'est pas si simple, il y a des risques. Il y a même de très gros risques, madame. Alors vous n'allez rien faire Comment t'appelles-tu, mon bonhomme Joseph, monsieur. Joseph Meister. It's hard to imagine what Pasteur, who had lost two children to infectious disease, might have felt before this boy, who was perhaps doomed to die if he didn't act. It's hard to imagine the anguish he may have felt. It had worked with dogs, but there was no guarantee it would work on a human. Roux was firmly against it. Roux was a doctor, and it was he who performed the injections. On top of this, he'd written his thesis on rabies, so if he could challenge Pasteur on anything, it was that. No, it's too risky. You have seen these wounds. If we don't take the risk, this child will be passed. Oui, mais même si le chien est enragé, c'est pas sûr que le petit soit infecté. Ce qui est sûr, c'est que s'il est infecté, il va mourir. Oui ou non Oui, monsieur. Et vous voulez le laisser mourir Qu'est-ce que vous direz à sa mère si on ne fait rien Oui, si on échoue. Ce sont des dizaines d'autres gosses qu'on pourra jamais sauver. Mais je sais bien, vous. C'est un risque, un gros risque, mais... Vous êtes jeune. Vous pouvez attendre. Meister had been bitten 48 hours previously. If the disease was present, it would not be for a matter of weeks, which left plenty of time to test a vaccine. 
And what's more, he was Alsatian. How could this be overlooked for Pasteur with his fierce hatred of Germans? He had the boy examined by two doctor acquaintances, Ludpian and Granchet, who confirmed the bites were serious. Meister was no doubt contaminated. Almost secretly, Pasteur took the plunge. Le docteur Granchet va te faire une première piqûre au ventre. Ça va faire un petit peu mal, mais c'est nécessaire, tu comprends? Je vais essayer de pas pleurer. Tu sais, si tu pleures un peu, ce n'est pas bien grave. Mais il y en aura d'autres, tu le sais ça? Plus que dix? Un petit peu plus. Alors on y va, Joseph? Mm. For two weeks, Joseph was injected with nerve tissue infected with weakened rabies. Each day, the dose administered was increased, so his body would become accustomed to it. But one doubt remained. What if Meister did not have rabies? How could they prove the vaccination had worked? That was the aim of the 13th and final injection. He needed that crucial test. And at the end of the treatment with Joseph Meister, he injected him with rabies. At the end of the course, he had him injected with totally virulent nerve tissue, which would have given Meister rabies if he had not been protected by the previous injections. For him, this was the validation of his theory. But you can see why today this type of treatment would be unacceptable. My dear friend, I think something amazing has occurred. Joseph Meister came out of the laboratory. The child is in fine health this morning. He has a good appetite and no longer has any fever. One of the great medical feats of the century is underway. This time, Pasteur was sure of himself. He could repeat his exploit, this time giving it maximum publicity. He chose to vaccinate Jean-Baptiste Juppy, a shepherd boy who was bitten, saving his friends from a rabid dog. It was an ideal story to promote his vaccine. In the following weeks, people came from around the world to be vaccinated in Paris. Faced with such success, the Academy of Sciences opened an international subscription to found an institute. Pasteur was a hero. At the end of 1889, Professor Koch. Professor Koch shut himself mysteriously into his laboratory. Professor, you have need something? He was hoping to pull off a major coup. He had resumed his study of tuberculosis, the bacteria which made him famous. Only now, he wanted to take the next logical step and find a remedy. If he could find a cure for tuberculosis, that would far outstrip what Pasteur had done with rabies. After several months, Koch had obtained some promising results, having cured some guinea pigs infected with tuberculosis. Koch was confident he was on the right track. But the most celebrated scholar in Germany was under great pressure to come up with results. On the 4th of August, 1890, the 10th International Medical Congress was held in Berlin. Koch was to be the star. The Kaiser wanted to show the world the superiority of German medicine and was counting on a major announcement from his champion. Koch knew his findings were only partial. He had yet to do any human trials. 
but pressed by his superiors, he took the plunge. Chers confrères, je suis très honoré d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. He gave a presentation on microbiology in general, but right at the end, in the last two minutes, he dropped a bombshell. J'ai trouvé plusieurs substances capables d'entraver le développement du bacille tuberculeux. Des cobayes qui en ont absorbé sont restés réfractaires à l'inoculation tuberculeuse. An sich ist Koch was still very prudent at that conference. But he was considered a very serious scientist, meticulous and precise. So everyone thought if Robert Koch said something, there must have been much more to it. Messieurs, je vous remercie de votre attention. Bravo! The conference attendees were in doubt. Koch had found a cure for tuberculosis. Tuberculin, as Koch called it, was presented by the press as the greatest discovery in the history of humanity. Sick people flocked to Berlin from all over the world to be treated. The government built a research establishment along the same lines as that built for Pasteur. Robert Koch would have his own institute. In Paris, some voiced their reservations about this miracle cure. Pasteur himself silenced the critics. But Robert Koch had jumped the gun. After hundreds of people had received injections, the initial results were disastrous. It quickly became clear that tuberculin was actually harmful and that the sick who received the treatment suffered more from tuberculosis than those who received nothing. Robert Koch was in a tight spot. His fall from grace was not yet over. As his triumph turned into a fiasco, events in his personal life further tarnished his image. Koch was now spending more time at the theater than in his laboratory. Vous êtes venu ce soir encore? Vous étiez encore mieux qu'hier, Edwige. The renowned professor, now 48, came to watch Hedwig, age 17. Pour vous, ce n'est rien du tout. <laughs> Koch divorced Emmy, whom he had known since childhood. Two months later, he caused a scandal marrying Hedwig Freiberg, 29 years his junior. While Koch wallowed in disgrace, Pasteur was at the height of his glory. To mark his 70th birthday, the French president, Sadi Carnot, brought together some 4,000 prestigious guests at the Sorbonne. But Pasteur's health had deteriorated rapidly. Supported by his son, Jean-Baptiste, he made his last public appearance. Since their first skirmish 20 years before, Koch and Pasteur were no longer the same men. Pasteur no longer left his room. Koch traveled the world with his young wife. The rivalry between the two researchers was now continued by their disciples. It was a contest between two institutes, two teams. An outbreak in China of one of the most feared diseases, bubonic plague, provided the backdrop for one final battle between their respective followers. It was one of Pasteur's men, Alexandre Yersin, who discovered the bacillus responsible, just beating the Japanese researcher Kitasoto, a disciple of Koch. This came as a final satisfaction for the Frenchman. On October 5th, 1895, a state funeral paid tribute to a hero of science. 
Louis Pasteur had died a few days earlier at Man la Coquette. Profoundly moved by the universally felt loss of the wonderful founder of the Institut Pasteur, the Berlin Institute of Infectious Diseases shares in the sense of grief. Robert Koch. Robert Koch was 20 years younger and continued his travels with his wife. He obtained one of the first Nobel Prizes for medicine. In 1904, he came to Paris for the first time and paid a visit to the Institut Pasteur. The followers of his former rival welcomed him as one of their own. He died in 1910, aged 67. After Pasteur and Koch, medical science entered a new era. Henceforth, diseases were no longer defined by their symptoms, but by their causes. Epidemics diminished, and life expectancy made its greatest jump in history. The chemist and the country doctor had become national icons, so much so that one often forgets that the work of Louis Pasteur would perhaps not have been the same without the research of Robert Koch, and vice versa.